The 1st of September, 1939 Nazi Germany invades Poland, which marks the beginning of the Second World War. After defeating the Polish army, the Germans ruthlessly suppressed the Poles, whom they considered to be racially inferior. And in the weeks following the German attack on Poland, German SS, police, and military units shoot thousands of Polish civilians, including many members of the Polish nobility, clergy, and intelligentsia. In the fall of 1941, Nazi Germany begins to implement a plan codenamed Operation Reinhardt to systematically murder almost two million Jews living in the German-administered territory of occupied Poland called the General Government. Three killing centers are established as part of this plan, Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka. One of the main perpetrators of this operation, who will personally shoot thousands of innocent men, women, and children, becomes Willy Mentz. Willy Bruno Mentz was born on the 30th of April, 1904 in the village of Schönhagen, then part of the German Empire. Like his father, he worked in a sawmill and then as a miner. In 1923, Mance moved to Mecklenburg to train as a milker, and he passed his master's examination in this profession in 1929. The same year, he married and had four children. In 1932, one year before Adolf Hitler came into power, Willy Mance joined the Nazi party, and from 1934 to 1940, he worked as a master milker. The Second World War began on the 1st of September 1939 when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. At the beginning of the following year, Mentz unsuccessfully applied to the police. Soon after, the Chamber of Agriculture suggested Mentz as a master milker at the Grafenek Euthanasia Center, where for a year and a half he was responsible for the cows and pigs. Grafenek was one of Nazi Germany's killing centers as part of their forced euthanasia program. The Nazi euthanasia program, codenamed T4, was the systematic murder of institutionalized patients with disabilities in Germany. The most infamous of the killing centers was Hadamar, where Mentz arrived in 1941. He worked in Hadamar's nursery and was responsible for the institution's central heating system until early summer 1942. When, in the summer of 1941, Hadamar's staff celebrated the cremation of their 10,000th patient, they celebrated with beer and wine. Since the crematorium ovens were often filled with two corpses at a time, the cremation process was less than perfect, which often resulted in a thick, acrid smog that hung over the town. The euthanasia program continued until the last days of World War II and claimed the lives of 250,000 individuals. At the end of June or beginning of July 1942, Mans was posted to Treblinka extermination camp. For the first two months, he served in the extermination area, where he supervised the commando that transferred corpses from the gas chambers to the mass graves. He also often participated in the unloading of Jewish transports on the camp ramp. Witnesses recalled that he would then fire blindly into the crowds of Jews to force them to exit the wagons more quickly. Treblinka was constructed in the summer of 1942 and was the third killing center after Belzec and Sobibor, established by Operation Reinhardt authorities. Deportations to Treblinka came mainly from the ghettos of Warsaw and Radom districts in the general government and continued until the spring of 1943. Most prominent among the deportations were the approximately 7,000 Jews transported from the Warsaw Ghetto after its liquidation following the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising in 1943. A Holocaust survivor, Josef Czarny, whose parents died in the Warsaw Ghetto, remembered after the war how, at the age of 16, he was transferred to Treblinka, where he spent 10 months. When the Ukrainian Travniki guards came to lock the door, they used a board to push in the mass of flesh. We were crushed, crammed together, absolutely stuck together as one flesh. I remember some people going stark raving mad. They were drinking urine. They actually did that, Charney added and broke down crying. He later continued, I remember Hannah and Gita, two of my three sisters, crying out, Daddy, Daddy, but I couldn't find them. While Yosef survived Treblinka, his three sisters were murdered there immediately after arrival. At Treblinka, the process of selection and murder was carefully planned and organized. 
Incoming trains of about 50 to 60 cars bound for the killing center first stopped at the Malkinia railway station. 20 cars at a time were detached from the train and brought into the killing center. The guards ordered the victims to disembark in the reception area, which contained the railway siding and platform. One building erected on the platform was disguised as a railway station, complete with a wooden clock, timetables, destination signs, and even a fake ticket office. German SS and police personnel announced that the deportees had arrived at a transit camp and they were required to hand over all valuables. The reception area contained a fenced-in deportation square, with two barracks in which deportees, with men separated from women and children, had to undress. It also contained large storerooms. This is where the possessions relinquished by victims were sorted and stored before being shipped to Germany via Lublin. A camouflaged, fenced-in path led from the reception area to the gas chamber, located in the killing area. This was known as the Tube. Victims were forced to run naked along this path to the gas chambers, deceptively labeled as showers. Once the chamber doors were sealed, a large diesel engine installed outside the building pumped in carbon monoxide exhaust fumes. Within 25 minutes at the most, all lay stretched down dead, or to be more accurate, were standing up dead, since there was not an inch of free space, as one Holocaust survivor remembered. The dead bodies just leaned against each other. During all this time, the Germans would compete with the Travniki guards in brutality towards the people selected to die. Travniki men were Central and Eastern European Nazi collaborators, consisting of either volunteers or recruits from prisoner of war camps set up by Nazi Germany for Soviet Red Army soldiers who had been captured in the border regions during Operation Barbarossa, launched in June 1941. At each gas chamber, there are about five or six Germans besides the motorists, with their dogs. Motorists were the Travniki guards who operated the gas chambers. With clubs and lashes, they drove the people into the corridor of the gas chambers. After the war, Yehil Reichmann, a survivor of Treblinka, testified, When guards didn't expect a new shipment of prisoners to arrive for several days, they would seal victims inside the gas chambers to suffocate. The victims would die by themselves. When they opened the chambers 48 hours later, all the bodies were black. Everything was one solid mass. I shudder at how it was possible to have a two-legged animal capable of perpetrating such deeds. At the beginning, the Nazis claimed to be able to process a train of around 3,000 people in about three hours, later reducing this to around 30 minutes as they refined and mastered the horrors of mass genocide. Victims who were too weak or ill to reach the gas chambers on their own were told they would receive medical attention. Members of the Sonderkommando, which were groups of Jews forced to work in the crematorium, carried them to the fake infirmary known as Lazaret, where men's work from September 1942. This camouflaged area was surrounded by barbed wire fencing and disguised as a small clinic using a Red Cross flag. Once taken behind a screen, all became clear to them. Before them was a pit, seven meters deep and surrounded by an earth bank. In the pit was a burning mass of decomposing bodies infested with flies. The sick, elderly and difficult prisoners were taken away from the direct view of the newly arrived transports. The children of sick women and children who arrived alone on the transports were sent with them. Now resigned to their fate, the victims walked quietly or were carried on a stretcher by the work brigade to the edge of the pit and were then shot in the back of the neck by Nazi officers, such as Willy Mentz, who wore an easily recognizable white doctor's smock for deceit. Though the number of people Mentz killed in the military hospital by shooting them in the neck cannot be determined exactly, it is certain that the number of Jews he killed with his own hands runs into the thousands. However, before arriving at Treblinka, where he became one of the main executioners, Mentz was unable to handle a weapon. Due to his appearance with his long brown face and pointed teeth, he was nicknamed Frankenstein among the camp prisoners. Mentz stayed in Treblinka until the camp was closed at the end of November 1943, when he, together with Kurt Franz and Paul Bredo, executed the last group of Treblinka prisoners in a nearby forest. In the Christmas of 1943, Mans, along with other Operation Reinhardt personnel, were transferred to Udine in Italy, where he fought against partisans and was deployed to secure traffic routes. 
In the spring of 1945, he was wounded and spent several weeks in the hospital in Udine. He was taken prisoner of war by the British, from which he was released in the summer of 1945, and then settled down in Germany. From 1946, Mans worked again as a master milker, which he had to give up in 1952 due to tuberculosis. From then until his arrest, he lived on an invalidity pension. Mans was arrested on the 23rd of June 1960 at his home in West Germany. In September 1965, at the first Treblinka trial, Mans was charged with a joint murder of at least 300,000 people and aiding and abetting the murder of at least 25 people. During the investigation and trial, he admitted that he had personally murdered Jews and shot from two to more than 20 people from each transport that arrived at Treblinka. He estimated the total number of his victims at no less than 200, including children, but claimed that he had done so under duress, with no possibility of disobeying orders from his superiors or obtaining a transfer from Treblinka. He was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment, which was the highest punishment German law provided for these crimes. However, in March 1978, he was released from prison due to poor health. Menz was 74 years old when he died as a free man on the 25th of June 1978 in the city of Paderborn, located in West Germany. There were no tears shed for Willi Menz. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.